This is Larry Hedrick for Mysteries of Superstition Mountains, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Jack San Felice. This story today is one of the most famous stories, treasure stories of all time. Of all the greatest mysteries in the world in search for gold, this one is famous and it's still famous. It's called the Lost Dutchman Mine, or as I call it, the story of Lost El Dorado of Jacob Waltz. Okay, first off, I come out to Arizona in 92. I don't know anybody, just a couple of family members, and that's it. And I started taking classes at the Scottsdale Community College. Part of that is I met Marshall Trimble, and then I met some other people, and, and I started hiking the Superstition Mountains. And when I'm four-wheeling and hiking, uh, I'm also meeting other people. And so I'm in the archives, and I'm a member of my class. Uh, one of the classes was Marshall Trimble. He says, Jack, you got a Jeep. Uh, can you uh, can you take me somewhere? Because I don't have a four-wheeler. I said, sure. And so what he wanted me to do is take him out. It turned out to be Hewitt Canyon Road north up to one of the side dirt roads where he was told there was a stone heart. Now, this was Don, the cowboy, if you watch my Hidden Canyon video, you'll know all about Don. So Don is really hung up on the Peralta stones and the stone map. So he says, somebody told him, wow, somebody told him there was a stone heart up in Hewitt Canyon off a dirt road. Well, up we go, half a day going back and forth trying to find a stone, a big stone, uh, rock that looks like a heart. Eventually, we get to the last dirt road that goes to the major dirt road that would go, that we could drive on, that goes to, and it goes to Woodbury Trailhead. It's on the left. As we're driving down Woodbury, you're not going to believe this, the last, very last dirt road. It would always be that way, the very last one. So, off on the right, up on the hillside, there's a huge rock, and it looks like a heart, and it's got, it looks like what's etched in it is a cross or an X, but it's not, it's quartz. But anyhow, he said, this is it, this is it. We gotta go search there. We gotta search for mines here. So we get out and we start searching. Well, guess what? For two, two hours of walking around in circles, we don't know what's out there. I'd never been there. And I don't know where I'm at, hardly. So we don't find it. And I said, I said, Dawn, you stay here and search and look out to the east, and I will look out to the west. So I'm going west, and actually what I'm looking for is an old horse trail that Billy Martin Jr. had told me about a few months earlier. Now, Billy Martin Jr. and his father were very famous cowboys of the Superstition Mountains. In fact, he was the first cowboy I met out here in Arizona. So when I first met Billy Martin, he sits down with me and we spend two hours talking about uh, the cowboys, what famous cowboys, about Revis Ranch, about Revis the, uh, the hermit, because his father knew Revis, the hermit, about Jake Waltz, about a whole lot of others. So I'm looking for uh, a trail that would take me to the top of the mountain. I had no clue how you would cross those mountains. They're, they're pretty high, actually, over 5,000 feet. And they were called Rogers Ridge. Well, I come along and I'm going west, and well, he, the main clue he gave me was Look for the JF Ranch down to your left. And then directly up there from it, you'll be pretty close to the old horse trail. What he meant was by that, the old horse trail that came off the JF trail, and it went 
north and when it crossed the ridges and went down the other side and then it, you would take a left on Rogers Canyon and Rogers Canyon uh, at that intersection there, you would go right and come up the Rivas Ranch. And that was the shortcut way and instead of going all the way around the superstitions to get supplies up there. Well, I'm looking for the old horse trail because I had planned to do a cowboy book at one time or another. And that's all I know. So I go up and sure enough, after about an hour, I find a horse trail. But it's not just the trail. There are tracks, horse tracks in it. And I said, well, I'm going to follow this and see where it leads me. And so it, I'm going and I'm going and I'm going. A little over an hour and I'm at, at a saddle going up. I doubt today I could even go 100 feet on that trail on the uphill side. But hey, folks, I was 55 in great shape, lifting weights and everything, hiking three days a week. So it wasn't a big deal for me. So I get up there at, uh, at the um, saddle and I look down where Billy Martin said, if you go across the saddle, and there's an old trail that would take you up to where Revis, the old hermit was. So I'm new here and I'm trying to learn things. I didn't know where I was at. Anyhow, I've, the horse trail is still there. The tracks are still there. It's headed for some big boulders down the hill. So I go there to the big boulders and lo and behold, that's where the, you see horse apples there. And that's where the, that's where the horses stop because unless you go over one way or the other, there's no trail down for the horses, it's pretty steep. So, but there's a trail to the right, uh, a foot trail to the right, about a hundred yards. And I said, that I can see, I said, well, I'm gonna take this foot trail, see where it leads me. Boy, was I surprised. I walk in this foot trail and I'm looking down because it's pretty much covered up over and there are rocks here and there on it and make sure I don't fall in. Guess what? I pushed through some brush as it gets brush here. I started to step out to my next step with my right foot and there's no dirt there. I'm stepping on air. And, and, and so I step back and as I step back, I notice there's an umbrella of camouflage netting over top of this whole area. And so I said, what is this? What is this thing? So I go around so I could, I'm checking it out. And as I'm going around looking for a way down, I could see it's a 35 foot or so, 30 or 35 foot drop. That's how far I would have fallen. And I was by myself. I don't never, I never did that afterwards. Never went in the old mines or whatever without a, a constant companion. Well, I said, what is this place? And so I go around and I see a rope and there's a, it's rope, but you can, knots on it, and it's a hiker's type rope, and you can rappel down. As I rappel down, there was a like two by four, not two by four, but a, like a four by eight piece of plywood. And I lifted it up, and there was a hole. There was a shaft. And in the, sh in the shaft, there were ladders. They were aluminum ladders, so I tested them. I took my backpack off. I was afraid I'd get it caught on the ladder and there I'd be in back sh bad shape. So I take the backpack off, take my 38 with me and a uh, case of snakes and I have a little flashlight because I always carried one. And I go on down, I climb down the ladders and it's about 40 to 50 feet. There's about two or three aluminum ladders, maybe four, tied together. And they're a little shaky, I said, uh-oh, I'm, I'm about halfway down. I said, do I go down or do I look? I'm here. Let me get down there and see what's down here. So I go down. I'm at the bottom and I look around. I see some old timbers, hand hewn timbers. And I also, if I look to, uh, towards the left, I see a tunnel. I said, I want to see how far that tunnel goes back. As I reach the front of the tunnel, my flashlight starts to go out. The gadzooks, you know, as or Shazam, as old Batman would say. 
and uh, I got to get out of here. Well, I'll go up and get my flashlight and come back down. I climb back up the ladders. It doesn't take me long. And like I say, I'm 55, I'm in good shape. And I get up top and as I climb out, I hear voices coming from down the canyon. Now, voices in the mountains travel up, and I didn't know exactly what they were, so I was looking. I got my little monocular out that I carried with me, very light, but yay big. I looked down there, and I can see men coming. Still hear the voices, and the men are carrying long rifles, and one of them looked like an automatic weapon, AR-15 or whatever. I said, again, I'm thinking to myself, Jack, get out of here. This, I'm starting looking around, and there's equipment there. There was a generator hose going down inside. There were picks and shovels and all kinds of camping equipment and sleeping bags and everything. I said, uh-oh, somebody is working at a mine here. They don't want it to be found. So I climbed up and out, I'm out. And so I go around and where the trail comes in, I see, I see that there is a wash that's covered by the umbrella of the, of the uh, netting. And I'm gonna go up that way. And so I go up underneath the brush, I go up this, this uh, covered wash, so to speak, covered with cat claw and uh, manzanita and other uh, scrub oak or whatever. And it goes about 100 yards. And this goes uphill. And I get to the end of it. There are a couple of boulders there. And so I get behind the boulders and I look down again until I can't see or hear those men. They had gone, apparently gone back inside the mine. Probably looking to see who had opened their the plywood and gone in, uh-oh. So I run up over to the saddle and I run down the horse trail, literally, and then I cut back to the left or east. And after about an hour or so, I go back to that, that rock that looked like a heart and the cross in it. And old Don is still walking around in a circle there. He hadn't left. I said, did you go to the east? He said, no, this, that mine's got to be here. The, the Peralta said they had a mine right there. I didn't see it. I told him, Don, this is what happened. Let's get out of here. So we go back, get, get my, my uh, actually wasn't a Jeep. It was a Ford Explorer, white Ford Explorer with, on a truck chassis, really tough, steel bumpers. And we go out and we go down Ewick Canyon Road. We go south. I said, let's get out of Dodge. I don't know. I said, listen, you don't have a gun. They've got automatic weapons. We're way out gun. They got camouflage netting. They don't want to be seen. So what I've heard about the super mount, superstition mountains, what I've heard about the superstition mountains is crazy people carry guns out there and they'll shoot you. So we take off and we go back. We go back and I drop him off and I go home. Uh, I figure... The, the end of story. Uh, I'm not going back there until I know those guys are gone. Now find out what they were looking for. But in the meantime, uh, I don't get a chance to go back. I start taking more classes. I start taking classes with um, a photographer and doing field trips with him. And then uh, I start taking other classes in photography so I can start doing things and so, with photography out here. And I, I did a lot of things, but I didn't make much money at it. So back to the, back to the, the Superstition Mountains. Now, how did I get back? Well, I started thinking about that old mine up there and start collecting books. And I started also becoming a member of the Superstition Mountain Historical Society. And I meet some guys, and one of them, Greg Davis, who has a big library collection. And I started doing, in the summertime, I started doing research at his place, as well as the archives all around the state on the Lost Dutchman Mine, 
the superstition mountains, gold and silver, mining in general. And while I'm doing all this, I'm still riding the back roads. And in 1996, I go up to where the Silver King Mine is because a friend of mine likes the white quartz. Hey, we're there throwing away the dirty quartz. He wants the pure white. Actually, we're throwing away gold, silver, or copper. I, we didn't know what it was. So he wanted a great white quartz, and we did that. So I told you in, in the, some of the first videos I made on the Silver King Mine, I go through the story of how I met the deans. And so I'm working, you go back and watch that, because those are very uh, good introductory stories of the Silver King Mine, and, and underneath the mine also, inside of it became friends with them. So for four years, I did their research. I found where all, and photography, found all the tunnels down to 300 feet, all the drifts. See, I went to all the raises. I went to all the, the drift that go in and out like their tunnels. And then the winds is, is when you go down. That's a lot of work doing all that and searching for them and searching for information on the Lost Dutchman Mine. So 1996, to 2000, that's what I'm doing. And by the way, during that time, I got a job at the Scottsdale Community College get, doing what? Guess what? Teaching the lore of the Superstition Mountains. The guy I took photography classes with, John Demorowski says, Jack, I told him I'd been looking for a job. And I said, I can't get one because I'm too old out here, I guess, to get one in my occupation, which was police work. And he, and, uh, he said, well, why don't you teach class on the superstition? And I said, John, I don't, I'm no expert in the can't He said, Jack, you already know more than 99% of the people about the mountains. And you've been collecting the stories, so why don't you? And so I did. I did get a job there, so I was lecturing there for uh, the next 16 years on lore of the superstition mountains. And for each class, at the end of the session, I would take my students into the superstition mountains and would have, quote, a field trip. And so I was starting to go into all the more notable places like the Peralta Trail, uh, Garden Valley, First Water, uh, Bluff Springs, et cetera, et cetera. So I was learning those areas also. And while I'm doing that, I'm collecting information and handouts that I can use for my class. Well, after a while, I got tired of that. And so I put together a handbook. I said, this is the easy way to go. And the college printed them up. And it's called the Lord of Superstitions. To get back to the Dutchman story, or Lost El Dorado, as I call it, and the pit mine that I called the pit mine, because I didn't know another name. Uh, I started collecting this information, going to the various archives, and I was told in newspaper articles that the mine and these other places, that what books there were, that the mine's on the west side, the Lost Dutchman mine. It's within a five mile radius. In fact, I have a map showing the five mile radius of Weaver's Needle, that that was the big clue. It's near Weaver's Needle. I spent four years on the west side, beating my brains out in the heat, because I was here year round. I hiked year round. When it got to 110, I, I could still hike. I'm hiking in all those favorite places. In fact, I had gone to 50 different places. And I wrote a story and put a map together on each one. And so I said, listen, I've got to be a little more sophisticated in teaching my classes because I've learned a lot more since 1992. And I put out my next handbook. It's called Treasure Trails of the Superstitions. And I changed the name of the class. Treasure Trails of the Superstition Mountains. Everybody, and I got a handbook printed. Everybody got a handbook. Matter of fact, the class, um, the class coordinator said, Jack, we can't afford to 
we've got our budget cut. We can't afford to do this anymore. I said to Marshall Trimble, and Marshall now and I were good friends. And I said, Marshall, I, I can't get this book. How will you do that? He said, don't worry, Jack. Print them up and I'll pay it. I'll pay the thing. Just give me a copy. And that's what I did. Every time I did something that was new, I'd give him a copy of it. And uh, then I handed these out. And this, there actually was the 50 hikes in it, 50 maps, 50 treasure trails. Not that there was treasure there, but there were a lot of, this is what the people were traveling. It's what the book said to look for. And doggone it, I'm going to take these people out here. And I did. And we covered a lot of ground. About this time, after four years of searching for the Lost Dutch Mine on the West End and, doing, and dealing with all the archives and the museums and whatnot in the state of Arizona and going to, San, to uh, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, looking for Waltz's claim, et cetera, et cetera, going back to Washington, D.C. to look for the soldiers' story. All of this information I would log and gathered it. Guess what? By the end of that time, I had 200 three-ring binders. So now, we do, the, we do the 50 treasure trails. I now have 250 three-ring binders. Now, we're getting there. <laughs> okay, we're getting there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a long, continuing process. I have all these documents, the, the trails, how you get there, what we found, and photographs of what it was. And if it was in something interesting, I took photos of it. In one canyon, there, there are two stone, great big stone monoliths that look like Fred and Barney. You know, the cartoon characters, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. God, they look just like them. And it's in, by the way, that's in Peter's Canyon. People walk right by them, don't look up, don't see them. And there are other things in there. So, and there's a, also a stone that looks just like the character Snuffleupolis out of Sesame Street. Those are just some of the examples. So uh, you can get it, you put your imagination to work, you can see things in the stones. People th did see things they thought was in the stones, gold, but they were finding mica is what they were finding. <laughs> mica in rhyolite. So different places in the mountains, yet there's a lot of it. Now, back to the story, Lost El Dorado. So I decide, look, I want to get back up there to that old mine. And Jack Carlson and I start hiking in Rogers Canyon area. We're looking for uh, something called the Orcart Mine. Well, we go on one hike and we're one canyon over. And it was a brutal hike. It's all uphill, all bouldering. We were one canyon off. We get back. He said, we can't go today. And Elizabeth Stewart was with us, and she couldn't hike anymore. So we went, and we left. And I said, what are the other places you want to look at, Jack, over in this area? I said, I want to go up that up an area on those ridges. I don't even know what they were called. They were called Rogers Ridges. That was. He said, that was named... Uh, by the Rogers Mining District was James Rogers, who found it about 1875. But at the same time, the Silver King Mine was found. Well, the story I believe on this is that Rogers was there about 1873. James Rogers. And he didn't, he, he filed, only filed a mining claim because he had kept that area hidden from most people because he was working that gold mine up there, which was the pit mine. I called the pit mine. I didn't know it had gold in it. But then I got two rolls of microfilm. And they are on the Pinnell Drill newspaper and the Pinnell County Recorder newspaper of the 1880s and 90s. And it started, it has some great articles in it. It has these two wonderful articles a guy by the name of P.C. Pierpont C. Bicknell. Well, Bicknell was not just a journalist. He was also a prospector and had mining after, and a writer. So he was, pro he was prolific as a writer. But he was here in the 1870s. I'll put the rest of that story 
for another time. Get back to the newspaper articles. They have a story in there about a mine that has free gold, and they call it the Silver Chief Mine. I had, it said it's up on Rogers Ridge. One, I didn't know what Rogers Ridge was. Number two, I don't know what the, the Silver Chief, and this is in the 1880s. I said, it's all got to be covered. There can't be nothing left up there. Can't be nothing left. It's called the Silver Chief. And then it says, out of the Silver Chief, the gold was valued up to $10,000 a ton. That's the value of the gold being taken out of the mine. 1880s, now, you multiply that by the value of gold, because gold then was only about $35 an ounce, maybe $35 an ounce. Today, about 1800 So if, if you exponentially figure it out, it, it today would be about $100,000 a ton. Now, the Dutchman had said, my mine will make millionaires out of 20 men. That was alleged to be one of his sayings. Don't know. Well, I said, Jack Carlson, I said, let's find this, this silver chief mine. He said, I, I don't know where that is. He said, well, the names of, he started doing research. The names of these mining claims have all changed over the years. Hmm. We got any better information? Yeah. Lo and behold, we come across an 1882 Gustavus Cox mine on the Pioneer Mining District, which is literally all of, literally all the wilderness area today of Superstition Mountains and all the way down to the Gila River. And he said, look, up here in this Rogers Mining District, look on this mine there, there are five Silver Chief mines. He said, uh-huh, there are five of them. How big is the mining claim? 20 acres. Five times, that's 100 acres in the mountains, in the wilderness that we got to search for this mine? I said, well, he said, it gives a description of it. He said, it's a mine shaped like a pit with a shaft that goes down about 70 feet. I said, hmm, sounds like the mine I was at but I don't say anything to anybody. Uh, I just wanted to keep this under my hat for the time being. So we go out there and we're looking all around. Well, we get lost. <laughs> we get lost on Rogers Ridge. We, got, we don't have a map that says this is the way to go. We just have a topo map. And so we're looking at this topo map and we're on these, the ridges, by the way, the ridges, you go up and down six ridges, it's like six mountains. And it's full of cat claw, manzanita. Cat claw will eat you alive. Uh, back where I used to work, there was a term that said, this will eat your lunch. And that's basically what it did. We come out of there looking like the mountain lions that got us. Uh, there are mountain lions up there. But, and it, we, we sure got cut up by that stuff because there was no trail. So we go back, we start figuring this out. We missed, we missed the canyon. And if you go, if you come in from the south and you start going up the, that, let's see, the south part of that ridge, it's all brushy and all trees and brush. And you can't see anything. You really can't. You gotta really know where you're going. So the best place we thought was to go on the ridges. And we said, we're going to do it another day. And so we do it another day. And we climb those ridges. And lo and behold, we get there. There's Dick Walt, Jack Carlson, and myself. We get to this place, and it's the pit mine. It's what I saw before. And as we're going there, we turn around and we look south. And to the southwest is Weaver's Needle, and in, in it, there gives away one of the clues. It says, look, the Dutchman says, over top of my mind, you look to the west, and there's Weaver's Needle. He didn't say you were right next to it. You actually were 12 miles. You, but you could see it, and the shape of the mountains in front of you 
and it made like a gun sight. And that was another clue. That was the gun sight. I said, well, wow, wow. And I looked at, I, I recognized the horse trail because from the top of Rogers Ridge, it's, it's very obvious that that's a trail. So we go down, we go down and down below us, there's, there's that, that group of boulders where I saw one of them and there was a group of boulders there. Other, it's, they're almost like in a circle. So we know, I know the mines to the right and we go there. Don't you know, I push through the brush and almost fall in the hole again. <laughs> I almost fall in the pit again. Unfortunately, when we get there, one of two things happen. Erosion, because the plywood's gone, the miners are gone, the ladders are gone, you can't see them, and the shaft is filled up. So we started, okay, let's see what else can we find. I said, now down, down in the clues, downhill, there's supposed to be stone cabin remnants and the remnants of a corral, stone corral. So we, we scratch around the Silver Chief, not knowing what to look for. We then go and we're gonna follow. So we, it doesn't say how to get there down canyon, it says go down canyon. And down canyon means bouldering. And so we were bouldering down. And lo and behold, we turn, we see a group of a cluster of uh, uh, cottonwood trees. And I said, maybe that's where they put it because that would be water for them. It must be a ground there where they can get water. And so we come upon, as we come around the bend, there it is, a stone cabin, stone corral. So scratching around in the dirt, we find bottles from the 1800s. How do I know? Because remember, I've been four to six years now up at the Silver King, and I know what the bottles look like. We're at the stone house. I don't know whose it is. There's, there, the papers say, and the clues say, that downhill from the mine, or uphill from Rogers Canyon, <laughs> there's a stone uh, house, and there was a stone corral. The remnants are there. And like I said before, we found remnants from the 1800s there. And that's the way people built stone houses back then, from all the ones we've seen in the mountain. Well, we get there and it's looking like it's going to get dark. Well, wait a minute, it's a long, hard hike down to the stone house. We're looking up this mountain, we're not getting out of here, except in the dark, and the cat claw is going to eat me alive for sure. So we said, let's go down cross these two hills, which can't be far, and we'll hit Rogers Canyon Trail down there, and we'll go out that way on a trail. Boy, were we mistaken. We had to push our way through the Manzanita and the Catclaw, and that was, those weren't two little hills. They were, they were equivalent to two little mountains. So we had to go down, up and down, up and down, and push down across the small canyon, and up a hill, and we finally there at Rogers Canyon Trail. Jack Carlson recognized it. I sure didn't, because I don't think I'd ever been on it. So we're, we're on the trail now, we're gonna go back up. Guess what? We started this hike in the morning, and it was 70 degrees. When we got, we, when we pushed through the, the last brush, and got on the trail, my hands are numb. I said, Jack, how cold is it? It's Jack Carlson, he's, all, he's got all the equipment you need for hiking it. He said his temperature, well, he said it's 28 degrees. 28 degrees? No wonder my hands are frozen. That's below zero, isn't it? He said, yeah. I said, well, no wonder my hands are like this. They're like uh, some monster's hands. I can't even hold my stick, it's too, it's, I'm so cold. And we were there on, for a two hour hike, huh? On a two hour hike, that's like about seven hours now. So an hour later, we're still on the trail. Cause we're not walking like we would normally walk hiking on a trail, we're dragging. And it's uphill, it's all uphill. On halfway up there, we see a fire. 
well, there seems to be a fire at Rogers Canyon. I said, oh, there might be people there. And sure enough, in a little while, we come to the fire, and there's a man named McDonald. I, I'll never forget his name. He said, are you boys all right? And he said, where you been? And we told him where we, you know, we were hiking up, down from some old canyons down there. And he said, don't you know how cold it is? <laughs> he looked at us. We have summer clothes on. And it's winter up there at Rogers Trough. And we stayed by that fire for 45 minutes till our hands get warm. And I can move them so I can drive and out of there. And we're still about 20 minutes from where my uh, Ford Explorer is. At that time, I had a Ford Explorer. And we get there, and we drive out in the dark. And I said, let's go back when we're better prepared. We'll take more supplies, and we'll spend more time, and let's map a route through there. I tell you, it was hard. To, when we went back, it, I went back with a couple of other guys that next time. I was anxious to go back and see what was there. So we go back. I'm with a fellow named Joe and someone named Trent. We go back and we find the place. Now that we know where we're looking for, it, and we, we're looking for the circle of boulders too. From the top on the, the top of the saddle from the horse trail, you look down and you see that, you look downhill and you can see that circle of rocks and the big boulders. We gotta go down there, boys. We get to the boulders, we go over and we examine the pit, and now I got a little pick with me and we're picking through the rubble and I find some waste rocks and, and, and I know what silver looks like now and I break them over and it's high grade silver. So I take some samples there and we go, we're head out. We take some samples, that was it, to find it and to head out. Well, we played around too much looking for samples and the time going back out we underestimated the time of day. And we were 45 minutes in the dark, stumbling around to get back to the Jeep or my truck. And we get there, we get in, it's total, total dark. We're, we're sitting there warming up and getting some, eating chocolate candy bars and drinking Dr. Pepper, getting some energy for that long drive out in the dark, and so I said to Trent, I said, Trent, I hear something. Did you hear, yeah, he said, I hear something. In a brush, I said, it's big. I said, well, I know there are bears up here, because I've seen bear up here. I said, okay, uh, run around to the side, on the other side, Joe was in the back. Go to the other side and get, get my extra gun out, the glove box. And he does that. And he's, he's still outside the car, though. <laughs> and up this thing it runs at him out of the dark, and it's a big black dog, a great big black dog, and he's happy to see us. So we give him some treats that we have. And he's all happy with us. Next thing we know, it's pitch black. I mean, there's no moon out, no starlight, nothing. And up, up, we can hear something moving. We don't know what it is. And I said, well, maybe there are people with the dog. Sure enough, out of pitch black, they don't say anything or not. It's like they're not here, and then they're here. And I'm sitting on inside my car, and Trent's around the other side, and he's still got, my, he's still got the gun, and I got a gun under my hand. And these people walk up to the car. I said, man, don't you guys know the code of the West? And they said, what do you mean the code of the West? When you approach somebody from out of pitch black darkness, you always holler, we're coming in. You warn them. I said, don't ever do that to anybody. These people out here will kill you for that. They have a right to, too. You scared the you know what out of them. And so we give them directions to the uh, get out, get down to the trough and where the trail goes, Rogers Canyon. So that's where they said they were headed. Well, we go down as we're leaving and going out. 
Oh, by the way, Joe couldn't even get out to help us. His legs are so cramped up from that hike. He said he'd been hike, he'd been walking now for uh, two years and he's in good shape. His legs were so cramped up he couldn't move. He couldn't help us. He was lost to us. On the way out, I said, guys, keep your eyes open. This is no fences up here. This is open range. I said, and there's black cattle up here. The Martins have black Angus cows. I said, keep an eye. And no sooner I said that, we turned the bend, there's a in the rope, bam! I stop on the, I slid on the brakes and we pull over to this side and I take a wrong, I missed, just missed the cow and we made a wrong turn. We're heading down one of them dirt roads. So we get down there and it dead ends, we gotta go back and down the road. So we finally get out, we're all in one piece, we've had an adventure, I found some side grade silver, we wanna go back. Now those are just two of the many times that we were hiking in the Superstition Mountains looking for lost El Dorado. Now, as I'm doing all this, and so I took the time to put together another handbook called Lost El Dorado of Jacob Waltz. And I'll talk about my adventures up there. Now, in addition to writing all that other things, I've been working and writing newspaper columns for the AJ Independent and writing journals, this is a journal, and writing articles in the journals. I've been, I've kept busy writing quite a bit. I was up there over the last two years we were there looking for stashes that the Dutchman may have left behind because we heard that he left stashes. Now, time goes by and I, I write my book and it's about 450 pages with about, I don't know, 200 photographs of my adventures in the Superstition Mountains over a long period of time in search of El Dorado. So I thought that I would put this not at the end, but at the front of the book, because it, it, tells, it tells a story of a night in search of El Dorado, and it, you can parallel that to all the lost Dutchman hunters, and all the Dutch hunters that searched their years, lost their lives searching, and never found El Dorado. El Dorado, a poem by Edgar Allan Poe, 1849. Gaily belight, a gallant knight singing a song in search of El Dorado. But he grew old, this knight so bold, and in his strength failed him at length. He met a pilgrim shadow. Shadow, said he, where can it be? this land of El Dorado. Over the mountains of the moon, down the valley of the shadow, ride boldly ride, the shadow replied. If you seek for El Dorado, ride boldly ride. Well, where is the gold from the pit mine? Where? Is it the Dutchman mine? I'll say this about that. We'll talk about it some more as we go, the further we go along. The next episode will be on PC Bicknell, and then there will be an episode on Herman Patrash and Garman and Ted Cox, and then the last episode will be on the Woodberries, and that kind of takes it to the end of this saga, and you will have to make up your mind if it's the Dutchman mind or not. And of course the book is there, and all the clues are there, and all my adventures are there. And the adventures were many, many. I've only given you a glimpse of it. And the gold, where is it? If not there, where? 
this has been one of the mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.